Before I start talking about this book, it needs to be contextualised. In the 1990s and early 2000s, there was a very strong interest in postmodernism, sometimes also called the linguistic turn. Its proponents claimed that the critique they were offering was an existential threat to the practice of history, and a number of bad books were written by opponents who took this threat seriously. Needless to say, historical practice didn't change at all, probably because proponents never made any useful suggestions of how it could. And over the last decade, postmodernism has increasingly faded into obscurity. Don't get me wrong, I read a lot of this stuff when it was trendy. I broadly think it's an important critique which any good historian should be familiar with. And I think the serious work on this has genuine insight to offer, even if not fully realised. But that is not the subject for today. Today is about one of the influencers on the postmodern movement, Hayden White, and particularly his 1973 book, Meta History. The postmodern trend had a lot of influencers, philosophy, linguistics, but when it came to historians, Hayden White was the go-to reference. By the time Meta History was published, Hayden White was already a well-known name. If this were an article, I would begin by tracing the development of his thinking, but today I will focus on just the book. Though keep in mind that at more than 400 pages long, it clearly was not written in a single sitting, and some of its inconsistencies are undoubtedly the product of a long gestation. The book is arranged in three parts, of roughly equal length, but this is not the main structure. The main structure is provided by detailed examinations of four 19th century historians, Michelet, Rank, Tocqueville and Burkhardt, and four philosophers, Hegel, Marx, Nietzsche and Croce all presented like a 19th century historical narrative, that is, in essentially chronological order, largely descriptively, with asides, summaries, introductions and conclusions. The main argument of the book is that historical narratives, by necessity, need literary structures, and that those literary structures are themselves arguments about the nature of history. Meta-history illustrates this through its case studies, showing not only that they come to very different conclusions when presented with the same evidence, but that those conclusions reflect deeply held ethical, moral and political convictions, far more than they reflect past events. Though that argument is also the main insight for a modern reader, the 400 pages have more to say. At the most basic level, this is an intellectual history of the 19th century, but White uses it to weigh in on questions of his time, such as the distinction between history and philosophy of history, or whether history is a science or an art. But let's start where meta-history does, with the central theory, that the creation of narratives can be divided into four parts, from the emplotment to the governing trope. Each of these is then divided into four possible strategies. As even a casual reader soon realises, White is obsessed with quadripartite divisions. This theory is the most substantial barrier to understanding the work, as the terms are both archaic and idiosyncratic. For example, almost all conservative political parties in the English-speaking world in this terminology have anarchist understandings of history because they see the present as a decline from some previous golden age. So the reader has to learn a lot of terminology, more than 16 terms because White continues to throw new terms into the mix in the main body of the text. And this is then compounded by inconsistency. The initial presentation does not match the shorter introduction to part two, and that does not match how it is actually used for the four historians in part two. For example, the introduction uses the term radical for those who see societal change as desirable and imminent, but reactionary is substituted for it at the start of part two, and then never applied to any of the historians, two of whom we are to understand as different flavours of conservative. And there is also a tendency to try and force things into the structure, to either exclude positions or create absurdly fine distinctions, so that the quadripartite divisions can be maintained, which can be wearying for the reader. Once you are over this hurdle, 
How well does it hold up today? After all, meta history is nearly 50 years old, and White himself died in 2018. Broadly, it does hold up, unsurprisingly given White's substantial reputation. It's central argument that two historians can come to the same data and in good faith write different historical narratives because of assumptions which we cannot discriminate between on rational grounds is hugely important. And there is no question that the 19th century and the professionalisation of history is a moment all historians should have a passing familiarity with. On the other hand, the big weakness is that meta-history has no real sense of disciplinary progress. This is most apparent in the chapter on Hegel, which is essentially worthless. Hegel predates the changes worked on the historical discipline by rank in his contemporaries, let alone the advances of the 20th century, and as such has nothing useful to say to the practising historian today. But White does not see this, because White sees differences in historical narratives as exclusively the products of decisions which cannot be subject to rational discrimination. If an account was insightful, it must always already be insightful. If this were true, and it's not, then I would be doomed to always write inferior history to rank, because I lack his manifest abilities. Even those of my colleagues of similar perceptive powers would only ever be able to write history which is different, never better. Yet most of my history is in fact better than that of rank, and all of his contemporaries, and the same is true of my colleagues, and objectively, definitively better, not just different. So what did meta-history miss, and what does it omit? Well, the answer is supplied within the text itself. Meta-history is interested in only a part of the historical process, that by which the products of research are transformed into narrative. It's a hugely important part in the 19th century because the scholars under study all wrote on the same subject, relatively recent European political history. They all use the same narrative form, and they all do it with the same basic set of tools. Other than primary source doctrine, the period's major contribution, and the concept of bias, they have only a general injunction to objectivity, which leaves little room to disagree over which tools are appropriate, or, given their simplicity, whether they have been correctly applied. But none of that is true today. The historical discipline has moved on. Its subject matter is infinitely more varied. In fact, today, contemporary relevance is achieved more by argument from analogy than by emplotment or trope. The professional toolbox is more extensive and complex, and at a basic level, there is a lot more data. So the real difficulty for the reader of meta-history is not evaluating White's argument. That has very much held up but in divorcing it from the cumbersome terminology he employed and deciding to what extent it is generalizable to modern historical practice. Generalization is always a problem in historical study. There is no real question either that meta-history provides an insight into 19th century practice or that White correctly identifies an issue with multiple possible emplotments of a single historical narrative. And though the book hints at generalizing this insight, it never really makes an argument to do so. Subsequent works did, and those in the postmodernist camp undoubtedly went too far in doing so. But that misuse does not undermine meta-history itself, and it still leaves the question of how contingent on its 19th century subject meta-history is, which is not a question you can answer in 10 minutes. So as an alternative, let me offer a few thoughts on a reading. What would you set for a class? An advanced class, obviously, this is not an introductory text. I would advise against the introduction or conclusion, which are too abstract to be useful, and as I mentioned already, there is nothing useful to be had from Hegel. The chapter on Croce is interesting, and he is both temporally closest and the writer White seems most sympathetic to, but he is also the most obscure. It might make sense to focus on someone such as Marx you are going to read about anyway. The chapter on Marx is quite lengthy, but does divide into a first half looking at his analysis of value, and a second half on the 18th Brumaire. However, even better, I think, is chapter 3 on Michelet. It's relatively short and contains a succinct account of the theory of tropes in the first eight pages. The aside, all of the chapters on historians contain an aside on a different thinker. 
is on Carlyle and his contemporaries, and comes first so it helps to contextualise Michelet. Thus it contains both the theoretical model and an example of its application, a synecdoche for the entire work.